Welcome to another segment of Ecosystem Engage, uh, the Not So Daily Show. Uh, today I'm joined by someone who makes or has made a career out of helping us all stay connected and engaged. Uh, spent a couple of decades in the unified comms and collaboration space. Um, Anthony Bartolo, who's the EVP and Chief Product Officer for Avaya. And I'm also joined um, to have a conversation with him uh, by Audrey William, uh, Principal Advisor at Ecosystem, covering the uh, contact center and unified communication space. So welcome, Anthony. Welcome, Audrey. No, great. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Great to be here. So, Anthony, you're... Um, this must be something you've been been preparing for the for the last couple of decades. You've been working towards this whole unified communications space. Yes, they say uh, even a pig finds a truffle a bit. Oh, fantastic! And look, we're going to get into that. But but before we get into that, um, you know, you are obviously being impacted like the rest of us, right? You're um, you were sort of so home for you is Australia but home for you professionally is the US. And that's where, where you were heading off back to the US in your, in your um, role as Chief Product Officer at Avaya. And then COVID happened and you're now uh, obviously midway through a move. What does that really look like? I'm sure you've, you, you know, it's lots and lots of things going on at your end, but, um, and I know you've got large teams to look after and keep them engaged and motivated. But before you do that, how are you looking after yourself? Let's talk about that. Oh, that's a good question. I keep asking myself that uh, each day. It feels like Groundhog Day when you've got a global team, especially when you're in Asia. You're, uh, you get up in the morning and you're focused on the west coast of the US. Then you quickly move into, uh, into uh, the Middle East and Asia. Then you hit uh, Europe by the uh, late afternoon and then you're on the east coast of the US time. Uh, that takes you to the midnight or, or a little bit beyond. And then it starts all over again the next day. So the way I take care of myself is I look forward to uh, Saturday mornings. That's what I look forward to. And Monday mornings is another good day when the US is, uh, is down. But, you know, one thing about these particular times is that every, it's for one of the first times where the globe is empathetic. Everybody is going through exactly the same thing. You don't have to explain your situation. You don't have to, uh, it's actually a starting conversation with most people, how you're doing. Uh, you get an insight to somebody's private life um, and, and you're starting from common ground. So I find myself uh, taking care of myself by, by uh, understanding uh, each member of the team, regardless of where they are around the globe. It's almost an identical scenario, except maybe the background noise is in a different language, but the situation is identical. Yeah. And, um, you know, given your industry and background, one couldn't have ever in their product development scenarios ever considered this as a stress test scenario, right? In terms of what we're going through at the moment. I mean, this is stretching it to the limit. And so, but what, what does it mean for the unified communications industry? Well, I mean, we've had, I don't know if I would call it dry runs. I don't think it's fair to call them dry runs, but the reality is we've dealt with pockets of this before, whether it was a 9-11 scenario or whether it was, um, you know, whether you're operating in war-torn parts of the globe when you're a global company, you deal with these things. This is the first time that this has happened in a, it, with such uniformity. And, and, uh, uh, and it did happen in waves, by the way. It happened in some parts of the world a little bit earlier than others. So, you know, we lost Asia as a... Uh, uh, as some countries shut down uh, completely versus the US, which shut down about, you know, a month later. And then we saw Europe uh, shut down. And now we're seeing uh, Latin America sort of shut down and uh, pockets of Africa. So what you do is you see this little wave and, and you get an insight on how people are going to behave and customers are going to behave. Even you learn so much in such short periods of time that there's a little, there's a micro pattern that you get to see. It's actually quite, quite fascinating. So, uh, but we have had little dry runs as a, as a result because we're, technology is adaptable and organizations are adaptable and, and you marshal your resources around some of these things. 
you know, we did some amazing things. We did some things that we, we wish we would do better, much like any other uh, organisation or, uh, or government uh, or business for that matter. Uh, some of the amazing things we did were, you know, we effectively turned on two and a half million customers, uh, customer end users in less than a three week period. We basically birthed uh, uh, multiple country uh, companies in a matter of two or three weeks, you know, in terms of how many deployed end users there were which had taken some companies 15 years to do, we did in a three week period, we were forced to do it. Uh, and our technology facilitated it and allowed it to happen. And that's something we're certainly proud of. Um, yeah, you know, but we're learning all the time. And I don't think you, I think you just have to be somewhat humble in order to learn, right? If you think you've perfected it, then those are the days where your decline begins. Yeah, no, look, and that's very impressive. Um, I mean, given that, you know, we've seen decades of societal shift, you know, come together in a matter of weeks and see those shift in patterns for, you know, companies like yours and businesses, uh, industry to respond that quickly is really impressive. So, um, so well done. Um, and look, I, I also think it's, um, it, you know, it is really fascinating that we are seeing all these you know, the borders being shut and all these barriers come up because obviously people can't travel. But more than ever, I feel with this whole digital engagement that we're having, we've become far more globalized than we were. We are collaborating with our colleagues in other parts of the world that we wouldn't otherwise consider. We are participating in events in other parts of the world that we wouldn't otherwise be, be doing. So I think there's, there, is that, um, there is that new sort of uh, phase emerging of, globalization, I think, from, from a digital standpoint. And I think that probably um, this whole piece around collaboration and keeping us engaged, I think, will take us into that next next phase uh, quite well placed. Um, Audrey, I know that you want to talk to Anthony about the contact center industry and because that's one industry that's been, um, I guess, impacted just like everyone else, but then contact center industry supports multiple other industries. A lot of industries can keep their wheels turning because they have teams sitting in contact centers that can respond to customers and, and, and needs and, and so on. So, yes. so maybe I'll um, jump in and, and, you know, and ask you about, uh, you know, some of the trends that you're seeing in that contact center industry um, as a result of COVID-19. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, yeah, never in um, my life as an analyst have I seen you know, this sort of impact, um, I think like Anthony alluded to, it's it's impacted every industry, it's across the globe. Um, but I think, you know, that shift of um, agents working within the premises, whether it's an in-house contact center or an outsourcer, uh, right to the home has been just massive. Um, in fact, based on ecosystems research, um, we released some data and the data on the platform, when we asked a lot of CX leaders, you know, what percentage of your workforce works from home? Uh, going back 12 weeks ago, you know, that was at about the 20% level. Today, that's a complete reverse, you know, it's 80-20. And I think um, it's been a lot for the contact center operators to um, uh, adjust to because you've got to also make sure that the agents have the right collaboration tools when they're at home. Uh, you know, voice and video quality, you know, it's important. Voice is so important. Having the right headset is so important. Uh, having the right PC and laptop and monitor is so important. And I know in some geographies, um, you know, that has been slightly challenging. It's not been that easy to set the agents up. But I also think um, technology has really uh, come a long way. And it's been very encouraging to see um, all the vendors and also what Anthony mentioned, you know, having the ability to get the agents, you know, up and running just almost immediately um, within hours, within weeks. And I think the, the biggest thing, the, the other big trend is really the avalanche of calls, you know, calls pouring into the contact centers, the numbers uh, reported by nearly every industry. It's like they, they, they kept telling me it's unheard of. We, we've not been able to manage that volume. Um, so I think it's, it's, been, it's been very encouraging to see um, how uh, you know, contact centers have uh, pivoted towards 
you know, making the transition really smooth. Of course, it's been challenging for some, um, but but yeah, it's been a it's been a big shift in the industry. And I think an, another point to add is, um, you know, in my discussions with a lot of contact centers, apart from them managing agents working from home, managing the avalanche of calls, th there's been a, a a notion to say like, hey, you know, we need to start deflecting calls to non-voice channels. Uh, we, we, you know, some of some have said we should have thought about, you know, other engagement whereby we could have used the, you know, mobile app a bit more to engage with our customers to personalize the CX, um, you know, the cu uh, customer experience. But I think also making customers go to the website to say, hey, you know, and and and, and that that there's information there, and you don't need to call the contact center. I've seen a lot of that actually um, in in recent weeks whether it's the FAQ, whether it's the website, whether it's the mobile app. So it's this whole strategy around deflecting that just to ease the load on the agents. Thank you for, um, thank you for sharing your perspective on that. You know, I, uh, I have to say, um, most of us dread calling our utilities company or our bank or our telco because you get onto the call center and it's not, the, it's not necessarily the agent that make it difficult for you. It's, the, it's what you go through to get to the agents, right? The number of times you have to press one and one for this and five for this, and sometimes they're not even in sequence, right? So my question for Anthony, you know, with, you know, Audrey referred to customer experience, and, you know, if we consider that customer experience piece, and given the fact that we have the ability, just in layman terms, today with, with um, you know, Siri, with Alexa, we've got all this ability to be able to have this voice-based navigation, uh, can we not? When, when are we going to see something like that come into that contact center space? Because the customer experience and the angst would be much better, and the angst could be minimized, and makes it easier for the agent not to have to bear the brunt of uh, an angry customer. Yeah, it's a good question. I think, uh, look, fundamentally, I, I believe we will see and are seeing AI, robotic process automation, you know, machine learning and, uh, and those automated assistants really start to, start to improve that experience. Um, I don't think it's going to replace, I don't think we're going to get to a place where it's zero agents. I mean, that's, yeah. let me just put that on the table yeah. now. A matter of fact, I don't think I'm the only one. The analyst community uh, believes that there's about 15 and a half million, million um, seats out there, agent seats out there. And by 2024 or uh, I think it's 2023, it'll, it'll decline maybe only two or 3%, right? In a, in a growing market. So, and that decline is associated with AI and virtual assistants. Uh, but I think the virtual assistants and AI can really assist the journey to uh, into a contact center and how that contact center responds to a particular customer. Look, I mean, at, at the end of the day, w when w I look for a person, I look for a person when I'm calling in a contact center, when I really need one, you know, when you're in a, when you really need one or it's a, the, the consequences are, are quite high, whether I'm calling a 911, I know that that's not all examples or whether I'm changing a flight and I'm stuck at an airport. I want, I, I, I want a person who's on my side at the other end to, to, that, to, to confirm it's that uh, it's the brotherhood of being understood is, a, yeah. is somewhat primal. Yes, I don't mind the machine helping me get there or artificial intelligence providing the insights and the capabilities to that agent. So they make a, they allow that person to present options for me that are, that are high quality options that make for a better decision and a timely decision that makes for a great customer experience. That's what we want to happen through that particular process. Um, yeah, the IVR is a, uh, you know, a binary mechanism or uh, uh, that, that takes you through a particular journey that might be somewhat static. And a lot of times we, are, we don't recognize that sometimes they are in place as a function of procedural or compliance requests, right? There are, there are legal compliance requirements that force customers to go through some of this, some of this journey that you, you ask yourself if you're in North America, why am I putting my social security number in there multiple times? I already gave that to you. Uh, you asked me that three, three times ago. And every time you hand over, 
it's uh, I have to repeat it. Well, that happens because of compliance reasons or because of GDPR reasons or because of, because of different sovereign uh, um, requirements in different countries. And uh, so sometimes they're there for non-technical reasons, they're there for legal reasons. And, uh, but uh, I think, I think technology and people are, uh, show a lot of ingenuity and I think they find better ways of being able to deliver that capability. But ultimately, uh, I, I, think, I think that that human interaction becomes incredibly important. And the sooner we get to do that in a very productive way, meaning you get through some of the rigmarole before you get there and get that out of the way, the better the experience could be. At the end of the day, the, the contact center is an extension of the brand of the company. And that's a really important thing to recognize. I used to do, this is my second tour of duty inside the contact center realm. And uh, my first tour of duty was very interesting because I ended up having a correlation. I'm a man of equations. Uh, I got an equation for almost everything. And one of the things I noticed was when I met, the person who ran the contact center, if they were the chief marketing officer or the, the what we would call the chief revenue officer now, the guy who's, who, or gal who ran sales, then the contact center was an extension of the company's brand. And if I met the CFO as the person who ran the contact center, then all of a sudden the contact center was a, a cost optimization activity. Yeah. And then I would go and correlate the stock of those two relative uh, uh, companies and the the ones that were run by an extension of the brand stocks were generally on the incline, and those who uh, who were run as a cost optimization their stock was in a on a decline. So you could see the relative positioning of how they used this touch point to the end customer or their consumer, mm -hmm. and it's it's incredibly important. And when you when you understand that it is an extension of the brand, you start to focus in on these things and you start to fine tune the IVR or you start to look at ways to improve that IVR and not look at it as just an IVR. You're looking at it as, as a way to, to get to your customer and get to the root of why they're calling in. And they might not be calling in by a voice, by the way, they're coming in via many, many different channels mm -hmm. and demographics determines what channel they really want to talk to you with or proverbially talk to you with, right? Could be chat, could be email, could be uh, SMS. Uh, it could be through the application. Uh, it's it's a fascinating space, and there are some fantastic statistics that tell you about that space and and, and how they and how they uh, how we interact with those customers. No, absolutely, and I think you know you mentioned so many good points there, Anthony. And I think you know the one very important one that comes out in all my discussions every day is you can have as much automation and AI and really embed that into make that experience rich for the customer. But that seamless handoff to a live agent is absolutely critical because that's what's going to um, make the whole experience special for the customer. Imagine a customer just, you know, chatting with uh, the conversational AI engine and they get stuck, you know, they go 80% of the way for a home loan application. Um, and you know that this customer is actually going to become your customer eventually, but it will be really frustrating if towards the end, uh, the virtual assistant says, you know what, the agent can get back to you in the next 24, 48 hours. You've kind of like lost that momentum um, and it's bad for the brand. And I think that's why that human element, uh, to your point, you know, is, is really true. In fact, um, based on ecosystems, um, contact center research, uh, it comes out very clearly that whilst we're seeing a rise in the automation and AI technologies uh, across the board. In fact, it's you know everywhere across the globe. You know, voice is not going away anytime soon. The investments in voice are at about ninety percent, um, and it really it, it really speaks to this trend that um, empathy is very, is very much needed. And uh, we've seen that in the last twelve weeks, people want to speak to someone. They want to uh, hear someone on the other line, and if they are in some sort of financial hardship or they want questions to be answered, I think they will go to the website, they will look at an FAQ, um, they will get information from a virtual assistant, um, but ultimately um, it's that human element that becomes really important. But I think AI will help the agent also when they're on that live call. Um, 
with the customer to empower them to say the right words. And I think that's the power of AI in real time for live calls. Uh, but also not to forget, um, virtual assistants can be used to empower the agents as they're doing their jobs. The virtual assistant then speaking uh, to the agent to say, hey, you know, these might be the right things to say to the customer. Yeah, if I, if I could add, I mean, it, that technology allows you to remove the mundane. You know, if you could remove the mundane in the, uh, and, and get that out of the way. And, and if you really think about it, you know, when, when we start to automate things, even the most educated of us get sometimes confused by a different industry's vernacular. And, and, it, and it's ambiguous to us. You ask the question and if you're in an automated, in an, in an automated place, you don't know what, what they mean or what if you get caught somewhere in between the two. Now you're in this endless loop of the automation. Yeah. It, can, it, it tends to frustrate. So you tend to mm -hmm. zero out, meaning you hit zero to try and get to an agent. Why? Because you want someone to help guide you through the process. I mean, we did a, we did a, uh, uh, a survey, uh, I think it's a, couple of years ago, two or three years ago now, and I found it really fascinated, fascinating because we're in an experienced economy and, 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 and that's what's going to drive economies going, uh, going forward. 92% of consumers basically form an opinion about a company's image through their interaction with that company, whether it's, and particularly the contact centre. 80% of companies yeah. mm -hmm. believe that they deliver a good customer experience, but when we interviewed those customers, only 20% of them agreed which is that disparity was amazing so they 80 percent of companies felt they were delivering a good experience 20 percent of those customers felt that they were delivering a good experience now what's interesting is where the demographics come in is 73 percent of millennials left after a bad experience now that might be bad enough but the real killer here is that 85 percent of those didn't just keep it to themselves they went and told somebody else and, and that somebody else wasn't just their, their significant other. Yeah. They owned a keyboard. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, they told a lot of people in that particular process. And, and that, that damages a brand. Do you know that singular experience damages a brand uh, disproportionately? And, 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 and that's why it's important to do it. You know, at the very least, the numbers bear that out. Yeah, I remember, Anthony, when I uh, got into my entrepreneur journey, a message I got from my dad was he said, just remember, you do one good thing for a customer, they'll probably go and tell about five other customers. But if you if you if you mess up one time, they'll probably tell everyone else they can they can think of, right? And which is and this was before yeah. social media. And now with yeah, it's just a it's just a keyboard away, right? Um, in terms of getting yeah. that out there. Yeah. Sorry, Audrey, you 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 were wanting to say something. No, I mean absolutely. I think um it's you know, it's CX today is a top business priority for a lot of um, brands and CEOs and that, that image and that brand. I mean, very few companies realize that, of course, it's the experience when you bought the plane, when you walk into the store, when you open the product. Um, there's so many experiences we go through. But also when something goes wrong or there's a query that needs to be um, tackled, um, it's ultimately the contact center. So managing, if you're going to have automation, which, you know, it's, it's already kicked in and mm -hmm. contact centers are using it. Um, virtual assistants are taking off. In fact, it's moving towards conversational AI now for some really great de deployments. I think ultimately um, you don't want that experience to be bad. So uh, having that human element and, and that's why agents, you know, I, I don't think agents are going away anytime soon. In fact, um, their, their roles have become more important than ever. Yeah, I agree. And, and look, I think in most cases, let's face it. I mean, we like, as you both have been saying, we like that human touch. And most of the, most, most of the times uh, it is those agents who help resolve those issues for us because they're able to look at our situation with empathy in most cases, right? It's just the process we go through to get to them which sometimes frustrates people. Um, as an example, Audrey, actually, you relate to this. It was part of your travel. I, I, I overheard from uh, someone in our operations team, you were going for, um, this was a, uh, uh, an event that Audrey was speaking at, and some flights had to be changed or rescheduled as part of the COVID scenario. And basically, when they tried to call the, the airline helpline, they basically said the wait time is four hours. 
right? So, um, and then I, don't I think, think in some was, cases, I mean, even eight hours. Yeah, but, but the long and short of it is, um, our response, as I got from our finance guy, was they dropped a note to the airline to say, we, we have tried to cancel, so at least we had a record that we've tried to cancel or reschedule the tickets, but we've not been able to get through to you. But that was a ridiculous situation. And of course, it's, it's unprecedented times, but still, if they, they could have had a better process around it. But in, in saying that, I mean, we, we're saying voice is, of course, very important. We want that human touch, right? We want those things resolved. But do you also feel with the whole digital experience, with everything on people's mobile devices, do you believe that we need to move, there's going to be a shift from voice, SMS, or email to sort of a rise in you know, messaging through in-app messaging and notifications um, on, on a mobile device? Um, I'll, I'll take that one if you like. Um, yeah, absolutely, it has been happening. If you took a look at the statistics on, um, firstly, A to P messaging, which is application to person messaging, that has been on the rise for quite a few years. Um, and the two drivers there are two-factor authentication. So online banking, uh, you know, when, when you're performing a function, having a heterogeneous outside of an app verification that it was actually you, and because mobile devices are so personal and they're biometrically sort of allow you to log in, the two-factor authentication is actually very strong, that that's been on the, on the rise. A lot more transactions have been done outside of the branch than inside of the branch. But likewise, to have, have you sign up to an application. So, for instance, when you signed up to, you know, Facebook, WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, you, you name Viber, the first thing that was done was you had a, a second factor authentication of an SMS getting sent to you. That was from the application to the person verified. And now that allowed you to be on that application. And then from that point on, it was application or, or in application messaging. Yeah. So that's been on the rise because of that, uh, those two things. And now I think you're seeing application to application messaging being, you know, there are billions of those messages happening each and every day. And we're all contributing to that. But, that, uh, but that's a homogeneous in-app in messaging. But when you require messaging outside of that, if somebody else is not on the platform, it goes to application to person or person to person messaging. And I, I think, yeah, I think it's in use today quite widely and uh, is table stakes today. And I think that's just another, it's an, I use multiple platforms. I mean, I think I have every messaging app that there, that there is because I have, and it's, and it's cultural. In Asia, we use, uh, you know, line in, uh, in uh, um, some countries. We use WhatsApp in, uh, in India. We use, uh, uh, we use WeChat in, in China, uh, right? We, so it's very different uh, along those cultural groups. So it's not, it's not unusual for somebody to have multiple of those, of those apps. Um, and SMS is the default outside of, uh, outside of those. If, you, if nobody gets through on these, then you try on, on your SMS. And if that doesn't work, then you're picking up the phone just to make sure that that person still exists or you're on their radar on their, uh, radar or on their contact list. It's, it's the, it all depends on how important the topic is. No, I think it's, uh, it's you know, messaging itself is, um, is, you know, to your point, all those channels, you know, line, WeChat, I think um, as more and more consumers use that, you know, that's really an opportunity um, to reach your customers, you know, when you want to solve a problem, uh, solve an issue, confirm something through WhatsApp, personalize that experience. And I'm starting to see uh, more and more brands do that. Um, you know, I, I know some European airlines, for example, that's the way they are confirming the booking, uh, you know, when the customer books a ticket, but also if something goes wrong along the way, They've tried the contact center, but now they're going to send, uh, you know, notification to say, hey, we've, you know, solved this problem. It's happening um, through WhatsApp. So it's very encouraging to see that um, more and more brands are opening up, servicing customers beyond just SMS, but through all these social media channels. I think one thing that I uh, caught me, uh, you know, off guard lately is because um, I, you know, I was trying to reach contact center and I couldn't get through in recent weeks 
And I realized that it was just, you know, impossible to, uh, they, they put me on very long wait times. And then I thought, I'll send an email, but I didn't get anywhere. And uh, I decided to go to Twitter. And I was just fascinated by the service I got, uh, not on the public forum, but on the direct message um, from Twitter. And my problems were solved. So there was an agent helping me through that. Uh, and the beauty about that, uh, just like how it is with messaging or WhatsApp is you can see a trail and even over a five day period, the trail is there um, to show the conversation you've had with the agent um, every day, you know, has the issue been resolved and all that is recorded. Uh, and I think it was just beautiful. And I, I think Twitter as a channel when other channels don't work uh, it is also on the rise. Yeah, I think, I think uh, we, we call that obviously customer journey, right? Cust uh, uh, um, companies now looking at the customer journey. How did they get to where they got to? What channels did they use? How did they get there? How can we make that much more efficient? And that's where that insights matter. You know, when we provide insight, a 360 degree view of that customer journey, and the company can then empathize with that journey and then optimize for, for the customer. And that's where we're getting to now, which is really really quite fascinating so yeah, it is media, it's fascinating fascinating yeah, fascinating. well well you know they say sunlight sometimes is the best disinfectant i think we've heard that a lot of time and when you put things in a broad broad world then then uh th th then people see the consequences of that and they want to make sure they do clean up and therefore start to avoid that going forward so it is uh we're entering into a space that's what i call the experience economy you know, where someone's experience is going to be of paramount importance to a company, not an afterthought, right? So, Anthony, we've, um, you know, I like the term experience economy, because I think that sums it all up, because it's not just customer experience. Um, you know, we know, for example, um, our research actually shows uh, that one of the biggest factors driving High, high customer experience is employee experience, right? So you obviously have to create an environment where agents are not getting the brunt of things and they're, you know, yeah. they're not having a hard day all through the day, right? I mean, they're human beings yeah. as well. Uh, and, and some of them work very hard and, you know, are, are working in parts of the world where they have to commute long distances to get to work or, or live away from home. So, um, so it's, this, all the more emphasizes the need for that whole experience economy to be driven down. Not yet. I think it's the CMO and your chief revenue officer who can drive that brand messaging, but it actually must be coming all the way down from the CEO and most of these um, strong brands. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, there is a uh, plenty of studies that show that the happiness of the agent correlates very highly to the experience the customer gets. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Audrey would agree if you, actually you need only go to a contact center and understand how they're run. If you take a look at large contact centers, they are, they are a community unto themselves. The environment that the agent is involved in, and, and this talks to a little bit on the work from home agent a little bit, because I believe that we're working, the agent is working from home as a necessity right now, but I don't believe that it's optimal. I, I believe there'll be some elasticity going back to the environment because one is the contact, that, that relationship with happiness tying to, tying to a customer experience means that they're creating an environment where it's, it's a, it's a fun environment. It's happy. It's collegiate. Um, it's uniform. Um, and it's, you know, a safe and, a, and once again, a, a fun environment. If you take a look at the demographics of the people who are answering those calls, they, they, they you know, there's, they, you have to visit them to see them. They're a little ecosystem amongst themselves. That shift gets together. They eat dinner together or they have lunch together and there's a lot of fun things going on. They're just creating a fantastic environment and and that's because it's tying to to the happiness of the customer the agent therefore correlating to a great customer experience and the contact center is a tightly run unit they squeeze seconds out of the average wait time and hold time and all these metrics and that's why they're they're controlling the environment 
they lose a little bit of that control when you send the agents home in these circumstances mm -hmm. and there's a dog barking in the background, there's kids crying or running in and out and, and, and you know, and you've got, and you're calling in because you're under, let's say you're a customer and you're calling in and you know, sometimes you're calling in out of contact center, you've mentioned before, you don't, you don't want to call in, but you want to touch base with a human who's not distracted with their own lives. They're intently focused on why you're calling them, not with a crying child in the background, not with a dog uh, barking to try and get in or out of the, uh, out of the room. And, and they want to focus on your issue, which might be an insurance claim. It might be a healthcare scare or claim. It might be many, many different things. And that's why I don't think, I think the work from home or the remote agent is going to be a fundamental requirement in an RFP for a customer from this point on, like the ability, because I don't, because it's called COVID-19 right now, but there was a COVID-18 and 17 and 16. There's going to be a 20, 21, 22 in the future. And I think people recognize that it's at the forefront of, of the psyche of the IT guys. So therefore, they're going to make sure that they have the technology to, to enable it in, the, in future but not for 100% of their agents, but not for, uh, as, a, as the permanent way forward. Um, you know, one of the stats were prior to COVID-19 that they believe that 30% uh, of the agents or, or even employees will be work from home or work remotely by 2023. I think that's gonna be revised, right? I'm very sure it's gonna be revised, but I think it's gonna be not near 50% maybe by 2023. I don't think it's gonna be 100%. So I, I, I think that's an important thing to recognize that, that that flexibility is important, but that keeping that agent happy, stimulated and, and really excited about going to work and, and to be galvanized, galvanized around the purpose of why they're there, which is for that end customer, is I think a really important thing. And you don't want them to be distracted in a different environment, right? And, uh, and, and I think that's a dynamic that's not going to go away. I think we'll we'll snap back to that a little bit. No, I think it's a really good point. Very, um, you know, something very unique to the contact center industry. And that is, yeah. um, they've always been together to your point, Anthony, they would have meals together in a canteen. There'll be 2000 agents together for training and coaching. Um, and when the supervisor, you know, wants to talk to an agent and say, hey, you need to take the next call. This is a really important call. He walks up to him to tap him on the shoulder. Now all those dynamics are lost, you know, in recent weeks with the agents working from home. So I think we, we will see a blended model moving forward. It will be a request in the RFP. I think the other request in the RFP will be, you know, we, we also want to see other locations for, you know, backup purposes. Um, because, you know, there have been disruption in some outsourcing locations. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think the blended model is, um, is, is here to stay. And I think, um, you know, the other one that I keep hearing a lot is uh, instances where agents have not been able to work from home uh, is when uh, there's so much of um, governance around the data for, you know, government clients, healthcare clients. And I, I know for a few of them in even this part of the world, uh, they've had agents work from the office um, in recent weeks, and they've just been very strict with hygiene measures, uh, really strict, separating them across floors, um, having them spread out. Uh, but they've had to go to the office. It, it's just been a requirement on some contracts. Um, so we will see a blended model, but I think this this whole experience in the last 12 weeks have also helped contact centers realize what they can do um, how they can prepare for it and what they can ultimately um, do to, if, if they really want to split the workforce, they've, they've already experimented with different models. So I think it's, it's been a really good exercise. Yeah. And look, from what I was um, just uh, hearing from both of you and the previous point around the agents, I thought, you know, I haven't really thought about it as much, but I just, given what you, were, what, what you both were saying, how hard must it be to be that person who's listening to someone's problems for eight hours a day, right? Because most of them, most of us call a contact center when there's a problem, right? We are angry, yep, yep. we're upset, and you have to deal with problems. So that in itself is a really hard gig to, uh, to have, right? Just to listen to someone's problems for, for eight hours and just staying sane through it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I uh, hadn't really, 
I'd be a lot more appreciative of uh, the people when I'm speaking to them next time when I call them and uh, I make it a point to thank them in advance for their help. Uh, sorry, Anthony, uh, I know you, you had some thoughts to share as well. No, I think your point was, I think your point's well taken. A and, you know, it's, it, it, we all need an empathetic ear. And those environments are created, the, the contact center agent environment is, are created to not only deal with the customer, but the agent to your point, when they do have that, if you have eight hours a day of desperately trying to please somebody, number one, and not being able to please everybody, having someone who understands that, I think is important. To, you know, and you've got a whole slew of colleagues who can help you there. That's, uh, I, I think that's, that's what those environments are, are about. And that's why a lot of people are craving to go back into the office too. Camaraderie, we are a social, well, uh, we are social beings. That's why camaraderie is so important. It, it, you as a founder of a startup recognize how important it is for people to be together and galvanize. Um, and that's why it's been so difficult to ask people to social distance, right? We've been begging people to social distance. There's a reason why we beg them to social distance. It's because we don't want to be socially distanced for the most part. You know, uh, there is there's a, a primal reaction to being around uh, people, uh, particularly with shared purpose, shared objectives, shared experiences, if not to, if at the very least of which is to de-stress or to make sure that you're not, you're not alone. And... Uh, you know, I think that's a big factor. A lot of this is psychological, both for the customer as well as for the uh, for the agents as well. Not to be too prophetic on this one, but uh, you know, it's uh, we like to be. They say birds of a feather, right? There's a reason for that. Yeah. Well, look, this has been a fascinating conversation, Anthony. I um, I think just listening to more about the contact center industry, I think for me looking at how technology plugs in, but then emphasizing the importance of humanity and the, the, the empathetic element is uh, on both for the customers and for employees was fascinating listening to. But I also, um, look, I know we've run out of time, but I do want to thank you, Anthony, because it's leaders like yourselves and your companies that have helped us, um, I guess, overcome some of those barriers and stay connected, stay engaged. And so I really want to thank you guys. I mean, you know, you've, you've put decades of work into this, Unified communications and collaboration industry, and um, well, this is this is your big playground now, right? It's um, it's an opportunity to uh, to make that difference. So so so, thank you for uh, for that. Um, that thanks, Amit. No, it's been wonderful. It's been a fun. Here. It's been a fun conversation. Oh, it really has. And look, um, I know you're um, you know you're probably um staying confined to your home at the moment uh, in the short term probably not something you've done for for years so so enjoy yourself uh you know keep yourself safe and um you know our best wishes for for you your family and your teams audrey as always always love the conversations around contact centers and unified communications stay well and stay safe and um uh, I'm, I'm very sure our viewers are going to find this conversation very useful so thank you very much Thanks, Ahmed. Thank great to meet you, Anthony, again. Have All a good guys, one. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Audrey. Bye. And, and